Good morning, and welcome to Worship with Peace United Church of Christ in Santa Cruz, California on this second Sunday of Easter, April 11th, 2021. My name is David Patti, and it is my joy to serve as pastor of this open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ. Whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. Even with pandemic restrictions, there's a lot going on in this community, and of course, things are changing. So please check your email and our website and Facebook pages for information about our study and fellowship groups and updates on our program and calendar. A question on everyone's mind these days is when will we be opening our facilities and when will we start in-person worship services? <laughs> there are several different levels of answers to those questions. Know this, good people are working hard to get things going as soon as possible. I can tell you that we will take care for safety in everything we do that masks and social distancing will be necessary for the foreseeable future, that we will take a phased approach to reopening, beginning modestly and building as we go, and that we'll be starting sooner rather than later. So again, pay attention to emails, the website, and our Facebook page. One of the challenges we'll face with worship services is that we don't have the capacity to connect in all the ways that are wanted and important. We don't have enough people with enough time to produce effective online services and lead effective in-person services. And we don't have the technology and equipment yet for an effective hybrid making what happens live in the sanctuary available online and bringing video content and people who are online into the sanctuary. It's possible with cameras and screens, improved speakers, a new mixing board, and an additional computer. We know how it can happen. We just don't have the equipment yet for an effective hybrid. And until we do, when it comes to worship, we may have to make some difficult choices. We will also be inviting you to meet in small groups in the month of May, once a week for three weeks, groups scheduled at different times throughout the week, morning, midday, and evening, to accommodate as many people as possible. These groups, called Peace Pods, will gather for sharing your stories of peace, your experiences of this church, and your prayers for the church's ministry as we begin a new era in our life together. Again check your email, the church's website, and our Facebook page later this week for fuller information. Good morning again. I'm so glad you're here. Let us join together to worship God in spirit and in truth. Please join me responsively. This is the good news we proclaim. Christ is risen. We walk in the light of his love. To live in the truth of his justice and mercy. Come, let us worship the one whose love triumphs over death. We celebrate the victory of God's love.
As we come together to pray today, I ask you to join in prayer as we mourn the death of Linda Appleton, a beloved member of this congregation who went to her rest late on Easter Sunday. We pray in thanksgiving for her life. We pray for the peace of her soul. And we pray for the comfort and healing of her son, Chris, and their family, and for the community of friends and loved ones who cherished Linda. We pray with thanksgiving and joy for progress in our struggle with COVID-19, asking for God's spirit to guide our embrace of new opportunity, remembering how many and how much has been lost to this dread disease and keeping faith with those who do not yet have vaccines or effective treatment or adequate health care here in this country and around the world. We continue in prayer for the strength of our sister Mary Mayo. We pray with rejoicing for the life we share with Nick Pietoscalzi and his 90th birthday yesterday. And I ask you now to name your particular joys and concerns for yourself and for others, praying that God's loving will be made known to all who want for health and hope and justice and peace. O Lord, our God, in whose love we find truth and peace, hear us, we pray. We thank you for the life we share, for the beauties of this earth which we enjoy through no particular merit or deserving, for each flower that opens and the garden they create, for each child born and the human family they continue for each song that is sung and the swelling chorus of all creation. For the blessings of the earth, we praise you, we thank you, we worship you. Lord, we thank you for the resurrection faith by which we recognize our role in your creation. Not only to be creatures dependent upon you for our existence, but also to be creators to sing the songs that make new harmonies amid the discords of life. Help us, O oh Lord, to seek out those who are caught still in shadows or loneliness or silence. Help us bring light to those held by darkness in prisons of mind or body, in places torn by violence in situations where there is no clear resolution or release. Help us bring friendship to those alienated by doubt, to those who struggle with impatience or with life's deeper questions, to those who look for companions and colleagues in their searching, to those who bear heavy responsibility and experience loneliness in the conduct of their duty. Gracious God, help us to bring a lively voice of good cheer to any and all we meet, a voice not of superficial soothing nor of rude, harsh criticism, but a voice of caring, trust, and love, a voice that is profound, not because it is ours, but because finally it is yours. Creator and lover of all, that we might see and reach and go beyond our present ambitions into a renewed vision of your love is our prayer. This day we pray for your church and all who are touched by the ministry of this congregation. Guide us with your wisdom, encourage us in faith, renew us in the truth that you are ever calling us to be more in love where grief yields to kindness, where anger yields to understanding, where all sickness, pain, and sorrow are turned to healing, trust, and peace. 
we ask all things in trust of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of John. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. Before we go any deeper into this reading from the Gospel of John, I think we have to address the troubling statement heard at its very beginning, that the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. To start, it's important to note that Jesus was a Jew, deeply rooted in the traditions of Israel and his first followers, everybody in this story, they were Jews. Jesus never proclaimed a new religion and his disciples would not have understood themselves in terms of religion as anything but Jewish. The new thing that Jesus did proclaim through his mission and message was the fulfillment of the law and the prophets the fulfillment of Jewish hope and expectation, the coming of God's rule on earth as it is in heaven by the reign of God's love. It was this fulfillment to which his disciples bore witness. The troubling reference to fear of the Jews reflects the particular situation of the community from which the Gospel of John emerged some decades after Jesus. A telling of the Jesus story that is not rightly understood as a rejection of Jewish people, theology or traditions, but in which we do see conflict between a surging religious movement and an established religious authority. The Church of Jesus Christ, divinely inspired, is nevertheless a very human institution. And one of the sins that stains our history and lingers in many minds and hearts is antisemitism. There is a terrible history of antisemitism in the church of which we must repent. And using scripture like this passage from John to devalue Judaism, demonize Jews, or justify any kind of racism or hatred is a perversion of the gospel message. Reading that the doors were locked for fear of the Jews is a reminder that we need to deal with our history and to engage with people who have been made other by opening our minds and hearts in love. 
as Jesus calls us to do. Which leads me to one more text that I want to share with you this morning, a wonderful poem written by a class of high school students. It's called Ode to My Body. Bless the ear, a gateway for laughter. Bless the eyebrow, bushy with wisdom. Bless the foot, which gives equilibrium to an unstable world. Bless the wrist, articulate as a spider. Bless the heart, how it beats even when broken. Bless the mouth and its ocean of words. Bless the chest, the loudest drama of all. Bless the belly button, which is the scar of love. It doesn't have a single author. It's a collective composition written by a high school class in partnership with the Wick Poetry Center at Kent State University. They call this effort traveling stanzas, working outside of the academic community with those whose creative voices aren't so readily heard. Veterans, nursing home residents, school kids, cultivating the kind of keen observation, leaping thought, and authentic speech that is the essence of poetry. It's a great example of art as an instrument of social justice. It's vivid and charming and deep. And this particular traveling stanza, Ode to My Body, and its celebration of the belly button as a scar of love has got me to thinking about scars, what they are, how we see them, what they tell us. Our normal way of identifying scars is as places of injury, I think. This is where I cut off the tip of my finger, sharpening a scythe. This is where I drilled into my thumb. And this is where they dug out my basal cell carcinoma. Most often, I think, we name and mark the meaning of our scars by the source or nature of the injury. But this poem, written by a 12th grade class at a vocational high school, helps us to see that scars may also be well understood as the beginning of transformation and a mark of healing, a place where the wound has closed and life found a new beginning. The belly button, mark of a life-giving connection cut off, is the scar of love and the place from which a new life comes into its own. This is where the tip of my finger was sewn back on in an amazing microsurgery. And where I drilled into my thumb, well, that's where everybody came to the conclusion that I ought to just stay away from things with blades and bits, adding God knows how many years to my life. And here on my face, that's where doctors did a skin graft so delicate and precise that you'd never know I had a hole, the circumference of a dime, and the depth of a fingertip at the crease of my nose, unless I told you about it, or you happen to be looking at my face with a magnifying glass. By definition, scars are also marks of healing, Places where the wound has closed and life has found a new beginning, sometimes richer and stronger and more creative than ever before imagined. The older I get, the more I appreciate my scars, inside and out. What they teach me about who I am, how I have been injured, where I have found healing and life in love has found a new beginning. 
there are some contrasting interests lining up on this Sunday morning. We have the biblical story of those very first believers, the apostles, locked up in fear, hoping for a new day and still scared to death it might be their last day. And we have the continuing story of our church and the gathering with whom we would build a common life in a shared faith. A diversity of experience represented in a very interesting way by Thomas, wondering if the reports and claims of the faith are true and if their truth is something that can be trusted, something upon which one might build a life. And the vision that guides and sustains us is where we see the scar of love, where injury, disappointment, frustration, even death, where it is all transformed by love, where the wound heals over and life, our life, our lives now, our lives for whatever the future may hold, our vision is where all that in God's eternal love finds a new beginning. The truth that claims me in the resurrection is that life belongs to God. We did not invent nor can we manufacture the spark of life. It is a trust given into our care and no matter what might happen in our struggle with the seeming chaos of mortality, God does not relinquish the claim or withhold the love. The liberating and empowering truth in the resurrection of Jesus Christ is that our lives are not a possession, but a relationship. And God shares the struggle of becoming with us. Thomas demands to see the scars and then puts his finger on the wounds of the resurrected body in touching and coming to terms with the undeniable wounds, he touches the truth of a triumphant life, a claim that will not be relinquished, a love that will not be withheld, no matter the struggle, even with death. Life belongs to God. And our stewardship of our faith, of our church, our lives, the lives of our children and all who will come after us, all the wonders of creation given into our care. Our stewardship resides in our respect for that relationship with God's love in all things. Recognizing that the injuries are real, that we may not yet see where and how the healing will be complete, but trusting and working in the faith that with love there is a future worth having. Bless the belly button, which is the scar of love. To the glory of God. Amen. Jesus is my plea, daily walking close to thee, let it be, dear Lord, let it be, when my feeble life is old, time for me will be no more. Jesus is
In these days of challenge, change, and opportunity, we are called to be faithful stewards of the gifts we have. Our personal resources of time, talent, and treasure, the facilities and ministries we share, and our mission in proclaiming the good news of God's love in Jesus Christ, a truth that gives us courage and charges us to build a future of justice and peace. Let the world see the beauty and power of God's love at work in and through us. Please join in covenant. We covenant with God and with each other to walk together in all God's ways as the holy is revealed to us, to give ourselves freely and without reserve to Jesus's ministry in this church, to celebrate through worship God's amazing gifts of unity and diversity to take up Christ's mission around the world, striving for justice and peace, to care for the earth and all her creatures, reconciling ourselves to them in love. For God gives immeasurable grace into all life and every life. Amen. Go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage, hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted. Honor all people, loving and serving God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the grace of God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen.